Hello, everybody. Welcome to the third annual Psilocybin Summit, a four-day celebration of the myth, magic, science, and culture of the sacred mushroom. I'm so glad that you could make it. I'm really glad my guests could make it. Uh, Esteban, welcome. So glad you're here. Um, Thank you, Daniel. Yeah, and so Esteban Yepes is a Dharma pilgrim, transdisciplinary artist, fermentation revivalist, which... That's its own thing. Ethnobotany enthusiast and a genuine agent of culture cross-pollination. Esteban is a certified health coach at the Institute of Integrative Nutrition in New York and a not graduated chef from the Basque Culinary Center in Spain. Oh man, I can add things that I didn't graduate from in my bio. <laughs> yeah, for that, sure. That it's a great thing to do. <laughs> that changes everything. His research is diverse and oriented towards a non-dualistic and integrative approach, has dedicated his life to the rigorous study of th the therapeutic benefits and no medicinal application and the ancient sacred ritual uses of cacao and chocolate in Central, South, and North America. He spends his, right. his precious life between doing Dharma practice, cooking earthly delights, singing devotional songs, making artisanal herbal medicine, fermenting edibles, walking the mountains, and drinking heroic doses of ceremonial grade cacao. I love that now we have ceremonial <laughs> doses, the heroic doses of cacao. We'll have to talk about how much that is. We're going to go about that a little bit in the conference. And today he's offering a talk called Chocolate and Mushrooms, The Doorway to Meta Shamanism. And I think that's meta as in um, loving kindness and compassion, right? Not meta. It, it's, as both. In, it's both. It's both meta as meta and meta with double T. Yeah, for sure. So this lecture is a deep dive into the latest archaeological, historical, ethnobotanical, and pharmacological findings about the ancestral roots of cacao's synergy with her spiritual consort, the psilocybin mushroom. This cutting edge, transdisciplinary, and iconoclastic research explores a variety of the genuine and mysterious. Fun facts, stories, pilgrimage, anecdotes, direct experience, and even pre-colonial codex recipes that unveils the almost forgotten potential between cacao and mushrooms. There's a bit more, but I wanna hear it from you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, um, Yeah, greetings to all the TAM integration, Salusaven Summit community. Um, I'm speaking right now from Medellin, Colombia. So I'm glad that we are able to connect through this worldwide mycelium web of knowledge and wisdom and happy to share with you the, uh, it's a more like a personal um, uh, self-thought kind of um, 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 pilgrimage that has been going on in the last years. So yeah, um, Let's go for it. And if you have a chocolate bar nearby, or you can run to the kitchen for your chocolate cup. And if not, just sit and then after take a good sip of chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess I'm gonna share my screen for a while. I hope you guys can see me also in the corner. Let's see how this works. Um, perfect. Okay, so, right, mushrooms and chocolate. Um, so I'm, I'm going to take you guys to a tour through different places, a little virtual tour. But for first, we're going to start doing a little disclaimer. Uh, the content of this conference is only for, in, for informational and educational purposes, and is not intended to offer any type of medical advice. If you, as a chocolatero or psychonaut or human being, are willing to put into practice anything you hear here, it's by your own responsibility, and please uh, use it uh, wisely. Um, it's not a substitute from any sort of professional advice, but you can always reach your local curandero, physician, herbalist, or other healthcare professional. I'd like to dedicate this talk to the lineage holders, to the stewards, and to the caretakers of the ancestral know-hows. This is Abuelo Tonio. It's one of the last living uh, Maya Lacandones who's still serving 
that amount of cacao. It's like a huge gourd. Um, and yeah, they're still alive and they're still around. So dedicating this presentation to them. So I want you all to close your eyes for one second and just remember that first time you tasted chocolate. Sadly, for some people, chocolate is like cilantro and like there's people that really loves it and there's people that cannot even taste it. But it's actually one of the world's favorite foods. So reminding well, when, when was the first time that you tried, it's also a good place to start. And if you don't like chocolate, maybe this could be an opportunity to give it a chance. Is it chocolate a food, indulgence, medicine? Is it a drug? Let's just explore a little bit about these questions through all the talk. So the Theobroma, word Theobroma from Linneo, Theobroma, Theo God, Broma, food, so food of the gods. Um, we are very, we, we, we have been uh, very close to this one but we don't know any of these other ones. These are all the sisters, brothers, and grandmothers, grandfathers, related of cacao, Teobroma cacao. There are fascinating amounts of them in the jungle. Um, in the different uh, journeys to the jungle, I have been able to taste uh, some of them. And they're actually an entire world, an entire multiverse full of different flavors, but also identities and qualities. Um, sadly, because the other ones are not uh, very known, they are right now almost, uh, almost only in the, in the wild. And there are some that have been already lost. So um, we're going to talk a little bit more about the recuperation and regeneration of the jungle through actually recovering these ancient seeds. So Theobroma cacao is the plant where chocolate is made, right? Like chocolate grows on trees. And that's a fun fact because if chocolate grows on tree, that makes it a salad one way or another one. Um, but Theobroma cacao, we, were, we have been told that there are three varieties, Criollo, Trinitario and Forastero to make chocolate from it. But actually, years ago, this researcher, uh, Juan Carlos Multamayor, found out that there are a lot of different genetics from this specific variety, from this specific uh, genus. So we have a Melonado, Contamana, Curacay. And if you see the region, it's all dispersed through the Americas, right? We have cacao trees all over the Americas, especially from Brazil up to Mexico. Um, but then we see that the cluster, it's right here in between Ecuador, Colombia, and Peru. And that's the place where more amount of theobromas have been found. Actually, Dr. Carlos Ceron from the Herbarium Botanical in Ecuador um, found out that Napo Galeras, it's a place to send a refuge, has the most amount of this variety of plants in the entire world. So even if cacao is from the south, then we're going to explore a little bit because chocolate apparently comes from the north. It's, a, it's an interesting conundrum. It's a mystery. It still is a big mystery. So we can date cacao relatives up to 10 million years ago. This is a research by the professor James Richardson from the Royal Botanical Garden. And this was presented at the Universidad del Rosario uh, here in Colombia. And what really surprised me from his research is that he found that the most old relative from cacao, it's also, it's, it's called a Glossontinum brugeri, and is a desert plant that can be found only in uh, Saudi Arabia and like far in, in the desert. Uh, and that's really amazing because it, it really takes us to very, very long story. We're talking about a plant that has very ancient roots. Mm. Now, 
as I was telling before, when the Spanish and all the botanical expeditionists and the uh, the people from the old continent that arrived here from Europe, uh, especially Alexander von Humboldt, um, stated that there was nobody drinking chocolate or cocoa bean drinks, uh, so the sabazes, you know, as they will call it at that time. Um, he said that people only would like suck the pulp and throw the, 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 the grains. Uh, but actually, apparently, Alexander von Humboldt was a little bit wrong. He didn't went deep enough. Because if we look to the archaeological evidence these days in Peru, for example, these are from Kirin Olvera, Nizao Gata, Stephen Burkett, and other researchers. Um, they have found that there are actually there is a big amount of iconography imprint in different vessels and jewelry and sacred ornaments that has a lot of relation between cacao pots, uh, women like yoni yoni style of uh, forms and monkeys. And we're gonna talk about monkeys during all of this talk because apparently. Monkeys are one of the beings who actually gifted chocolate, the gift of chocolate to human beings. And um, I think we give it for granted too much, you know, like, um, I don't know, it took me a long time from Nutella to drink a cup of chocolate, hot chocolate and realizing that I was actually drinking something that has a deep story like the one we're about to talk about. So this is this is the this is one of the most mind blowing recent findings in the archaeological um, side of chocolate. So five thousand three hundred years before current era, people in the very deep jungle of Ecuador in Santa Ana, Palanda, La Florida, were drinking chicha, corn, beer, and something with cacao beans that was liquid enough to come through this little hole. Maybe they didn't call it chocolate, but on the side of these vessels, there was found this cacao pod. And inside this vessel, it was found theobromin, not from Guayusa, because actually Guayusa has also theobromin, but it had other compounds that actually shown that they were drinking something like chocolate. Um, I know Chris Killam is going to present this year, so I, I like I put this phrase here. I met him uh, years ago in the World Ayahuasca Conference, and um, yeah, you know this phrase really 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 touches me because um, it goes to the core of what cacao could be for the world and what cacao was for the ancient world of the Americas. So he says, if cacao were a pharmaceutical drug, it would be hail as the greatest medicine of all time, and its discoverer would read the Nobel Prize in medicine. Now, on the left side, we have uh, Witoto indigenous. Uh, Witotos were very harmed by the um, industry of caucho. Uh, I forget what's caucho in English. Um, in the war, there, the Casarana was a big massacre that happened there. And it's, and it's incredible how after all what they suffer, they still open their hearts and their knowledge to the Western world um, in a very open, merciful and heart, heart centered way. This was a picture that Richard Ewan Schultes took in the Amazon when he was doing his, his journey. And this is how we talk to indigenous taking some ambil, some thick paste of tobacco from the traditional uh, gourd of Teobroma by color. So they keep safe the tobacco inside the cacao husk. And now we're gonna go a little bit deeper into this uh, mystery of the ethnopharmacology and the botany of the Theobromas that are what we can call the cacao family or all the cacaos. And uh, surprisingly, the varieties of uses of the pot, the tree, the seed, the ashes, the leaves are amazingly wide. And they're very unknown up to these days. 
Um, cacao and its relatives are used to make rapé uh, that's very popular right now, or, or rombe or um, um, air tobacco medicine. Ambil, that's a very thick paste of tobacco. It's also used as an incense for the cuna in Panama and Colombia, the cuna dule, use cacao beans as an incense. And it's actually a medicine for the woman when they're um, entering into their maturity. Uh, it's also a plant that uh, is used in very special occasions. And we're gonna see this because cacao has been used wildly in all these different ways but always with a lot of respect and with a lot of understanding of its sacred uh, power, it, its magical properties behind the pot. This is Peter Gorman, who is um, uh, an endobotanist who wrote The Sapo in My Soul. And he's been blown a uh, green rapé from the Matzes in Peru that has the ashes of the white cacao so we can see here that cacao has been um, actually all around the pharmacology of the shaman of, of the um, ancestral, not so well called American shamanism. Now let me take you to up to the north little by little, we're starting in the Amazon, seeing all these plants and this biodiversity. Now this is Ametate, and this was found in Barriles, in the zone of Barriles in Panama. But actually, metate, it's very mysterious uh, technology because this is the stones that are used to grind the cacao beans in order to transform them into chocolate. Um, we're gonna see more metates later. This is a, a picture of the Anasazi pottery so these were found in 1896. I forgot right now how old are these guys, but they're pretty old. And they're, they were found in New, Me in New Mexico in Pueblo Bonito. So up to Taos and up to the Chaco Canyon, there was people drinking chocolate years ago and uh, hundreds of years ago. And uh, we're just starting to discover that actually chocolate was drink all around for a long time through the Americas. This is, this is one of my favorite discoveries and it's about uh, the lost city of the monkey god. Hail to the monkey god. Um, it's so precious and so mysterious, but this guy, Captain R. Stuart Murray, he found this lost city in Honduras in uh, Mosquitia, very, very unknown place. It's actually just been rediscovered and you cannot go there. It's actually mostly secret. Where is it? But apparently there's hundreds of metates. So, you know, there's again, this uh, synchronicity, the serendipity about monkeys, metates and cacao. So, one of the stories, one of the possibilities is that the cacao pod went all the way up to Mexico by the help of monkeys and by the help of parrots and by the help of squirrels. squirrels. And in the ancestral myth of the, um, of the Anahuac people, Olmeca and maybe re more recent one, Mayans, um, there is this understanding that cacao was gifted to humans by monkeys or by a, a flying serpent like Quetzalcoatl. So that's a little mystery that I wanted to let there. We're, we're still researching on that. But this is a little map of the custodians and caretakers of chocolate and cacao traditions. And a lot of them still alive, surprisingly. Uh, Chontales, Zapotecos, uh, in Colombia, the Cuna Dule, the Matzes in Peru, the Nove in Panama. I met the Nove and they're very gentle people. They call cacao Oreba. And Guatemala, you know, in Guatemala, everywhere you go, the Quiche, the Tutuhil, the Cachiquel. Guatemala has a beautiful relation with cacao because they still use cacao for baptizes, marriages, uh, renewing of the cycles, even for mourning and grieving. 
Cacao is a very non-dual nature um, uh, sacred plant because it actually uh, helps us move through the bittersweet uh, stuff of life. And these people um, still hold uh, different sacred ways of using it. So if you get to travel to any of these countries and you meet any of these people, um, I would encourage you to be a little bit reciprocal for all the chocolate you have ever drink <laughs> or taste. Mm. These are some of the travels I have done during the last years. Um, the Chinanteco community in Mexico. I've been also in Guatemala a few times, uh, seeing all the revival of the cacao use. Um, but also Mexico with traditional uh, uh, cocineras, um, Don Fernando Rodriguez, who is here, is an amazing, he's a superhero of chocolate because he has rescued ancient recipes from codex that were almost lost. And if you go anytime to Teotihuacan, you can go to his Chocolateria Macondo, you know, like 100 years of solitude, and you can taste very delicious uh, chocolates that he actually revived and he actually took it back to life. You know, like the Jurassic Park of chocolate. These things were almost extinct and this guy just revived them again from Codex that we're about to speak about. Okay. Um, yeah, a lot of grandmothers still making chocolate in the, in the ancient way. Yeah, they don't, they don't talk themselves as shamans or as healers. They are just cooking it uh, in the kitchen. But if we go back in the history of the ancestral tradition of the Americas, we'll see that kitchen and healing places were always one, like the tipi, like the maloka, you know, where you eat is where the baby is born and where the baby is born is where, we, where you learn and where you learn is where you heal. And when you heal, where you heal is where you mourn, where you grieve, and that's where you celebrate. So these grandmothers and grandfathers from Mexico and Guatemala, they still holding beautiful, beautiful uh, connection and very precious recipes and know-hows of how to um, um, respect chocolate uh, for, it, for its nature. Um, yeah, uh, Tata Pedro, especially here, he just passed it away recently. I learned from him a few times. Very wise elder from Guatemala. Um, and yeah, Dionisia from the Chinanteco, Doña Abigail near Oaxaca, making, making chocolate atole. It's a recipe that takes six months to ferment the cacao beans. You know, six months for one cup of chocolate. Um, and this, that's just a little bit top of the iceberg. Again, we have the monkey. I, I found this guy years ago in Tonina, in the pyramids of Tonina, I, I think more than 12 years ago. And I think this was a, a little bit of transmission, the initiation to start researching about this. I will never forget the first time I see this piece. It's actually the the lead of an ancient story, but uh, it has this presence of being alive. And what really called my attention later on when I started seeing the picture again, is that she has two breads. It's actually a female monkey. And the two breads are actually two cacao pods. So we're gonna start looking deeper at how cacao is actually related with the mystery of the sacred feminine and fertility and all of that. Now, there are more than times there is new people, there are renewed paradigms. We have this ancestral side of cacao, but also we have uh, people from the Western way of thinking that are coming from different lineages and different origins and different ways of understanding. Uh, we, we, I like to call them mestizos. We, we are mestizos, nativos mestizos, raizales. And there is something within us that is actually pulsating in to go deeper to the understanding and research of chocolate. And these people here, I consider them as some of the pioneer researchers and actually uh, people that is doing serious work around the healing and therapeutical properties of chocolate. 
Brian Wallace has amazing conferences. You can find them, Vimeo. Uh, Jonathan Knott, he wrote one of the first books who exposed the ancient use of uh, mushrooms and chocolate. Keith, very famous, uh, the chocolate shaman from San Marcos. Florencia Friedman, good friend from New York. Uh, Carlos Jesus Castillejos, uh, a wise um, Anahuac um, medicine man. Josefina, good friend who works with the white cacao in Oaxaca. Marcy Senti also uh, revived a lot of ancient recipes and Hector Galban. Now, it's a big paradox, but actually we all are able to drink chocolate these days because of Pope Pio II. But not because of his will, but the will of the Cardinal Francisco Maria Brancaccio, who actually wrote an entire paper to defend the use of chocolate uh, in order that it was not to be considered that it will um, broke the ecclesiastic fasting. You know, all the other sacred plants of the Americas, they were forbidden, they were satanized, and they were sent out to the corner. They were all um, prohibited. But chocolate had a different fate. And the phrase that made this happen was when the Pope said that the liquid does not break the fast. And Francisco Brancaccio took this phrase and then wrote this entire book about it. So it actually made possible that chocolate was spread all through Europe and it was not forbidden like all the other substances that today we are starting to acknowledge that are medicines and sacred. Chocolate has different sides of its story. And it has a lot of dark side uh, because there has been a lot of slavery and a lot of um, commodification and a lot of uh, mm, using the, the, the seed and the pot uh, in, in, in ways that are related into creating uh, wealth. Uh, but don't see actually the part behind it that is related with its origin and also um, with the um, social aspect of chocolate. But yeah, it went up to being drunk in the French courts and it became very fancy and very luxury uh, beverage at some moment, coming from a very humble origins. There are I cannot say hundreds, but there are a lot of different texts from the colonial times that actually talk to, to chocolate or uh, uh, chocolate as medicine. And this is, this is really a topic that I would love more people to start researching, um, you know, scientists, pharmacologists, uh, but also people from 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 different backgrounds. I, I see that there's a lot to be done in this side. Um, and we can be inspired from this previous research that had been already been done. Now we got to the part of this conference or this talk that a lot of that brought a lot of people to not today here to watch it. And it's actually this marriage, this symbiosis symbiosis between chocolate and mushrooms. So actually these are a lot of different additives that were used in ancient times. So chocolate was not eaten. It was not a bar. It was always drink. It was sometimes drink cold, other time was drink hot. The bubbles and the foam was one of the things that people most loved and most revere from chocolate. But actually, chocolate has been used as a medicine carrier. So it has this amount of different additives that have been put into it. And some of them are what we can call uh, psychotropic substances, hallucinogens, but also psychedelic, but also entheogenic, but also cognitive dyslexic, uh, empathogens. There's many ways to call them. Uh, and especially this time, we're going to focus a little bit on the mushroom uh, as a narrative. Um, yet there were a lot of plants they would use to add as a psychotropic substances. Um, 
So Landra Guerrerensis was one of them, a uh, type of um, Brugmansia uh, kind of family. And then Olga Luki, the seeds of the, of the Virgin, um, among a wide range of them. And they are all, you know, wrote down in these ancient codexes. This is actually where we are going, <laughs> chocolate and mushrooms. Um, you know, I wanted to put this image to actually say that you never eat the mushrooms with the chocolate, uh, or at least it was not done that way in ancient times. Um, it, there is a science and there is some certain know-how and um, um, harm reduction guidelines that need to be taken into account. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. So this was one of the first books that actually exposed and quote and share the insights of the ancient use between chocolate, the marriage of chocolate and uh, mushrooms. I met him years ago and uh, he saw the book and he's like, oh, look, this tells around. And yeah, this book is one of those books that I, I believe or I, I sense that is worth reading if you actually want to go a little bit deeper into the understanding of chocolate addiction <laughs> or chocolate devotion, as I like to call it. So chocolate mushrooms is not just getting a jar of chocolate and putting the mushrooms in and eating them. So be careful with it. But um, yeah, at, at some way or another one, we can say that this new fad of taking chocolate that has mushrooms inside comes from these stories, comes from these actually facts that we can trace back in time. This guy here was Awitzotl, the eighth Aztec emperor. And um, when he was crowned, um, Fray, uh, Fray Diego Duran wrote the next in uh, La Historia de las Indias de la Nueva España. He wrote, in this whole story, I have noted one thing. Mention is never made that anyone drank wine of any kind to get drunk but only woodland mushroom, which they ate raw, on which says the history, they were happy and rejoices and went somewhat in their heads. And wine is no mention made. Mention is only made of the abundance of chocolate that was drunk during these solemnities. So that's one of the most far away uh, actual proofs that we have that the Aztecs at least used to drink chocolate with mushrooms. Now, what's the amount of chocolate? What's the amount of mushrooms? Should it take first the mushroom, first the chocolate? They Do they mix them together and then drink it? Let's explore other um, fun facts and findings about this. <laughs> you know, the cup, the mysterious cup that always flies around. So this was another one. This was uh, uh, 1540, current year, uh, La Historia General de las Cosas from the Nueva España, uh, Fray Bernardino Sahagún. So here we have another key about how he was taken. So uh, Fray, Fray Bernardino wrote, the first thing we they ate at the gathering was black mushrooms, which they call nanacatl. These are intoxicating and cause vision to be seen and even provoke sensuousness. They ate mushrooms before dawn and they also drank chocolate before daylight. These ate these little mushrooms with honey and when they began to be excited by them, they began to dance. Some singing, others weeping, for they, they were already intoxicated by the mushrooms. Um, funny enough, they believe that they were intoxicated by the mushrooms, but not by the chocolate. And the reality, the fact here is that they were imbricated, sacredly imbricated in the symbiosis and the mixture of both of them. So we will see that um, sometimes the mushrooms are taken first and the chocolate is drinking later. But for example, in this case, Valentina Pavlovna, that was actually the ethnomycologist and Gordon Wasson, the banker who became more famous than her, but both of them arrived to uh, 
uh, the well-known place of uh, Sierra Mazateca to Maria Sabina's home. And this is actually what uh, Gordon Wasson wrote about it. He says, 1957 Carinia. They gave us chocolate to drink somewhat ceremonially. And suddenly I recall the words of the early Spanish writer who had said that before the mushrooms were served, chocolate was drunk. I sense it, what we were in for. At long last, we were discovering the ancient communal right still surviving. We were going to witness it. The mushrooms lay there in the box, regarded by everyone respectfully, but without solemnity. So we know this is a bitter sweet uh, sip to drink because we know what happened or a lot of us know what happened uh, after his visit uh, for the Mazateco people. Um, and even Maria Sabina years later said the mushrooms are not the same. Um, but there are ways where we can, we can actually do things to balance and to regenerate and to be more reciprocal to this ancient uh, lineage holders and, um, caretakers. Now, the important part of what I wanted to put this is because here it's clearly said that first is drink the chocolate and then later on the mushrooms are ate. So we are getting a little bit about the know-how. And this is uh, one of the findings that we discovered. Um, and this, well, what we like to call uh, in a loving kindness and like family way, the Holy Trinity and the sacred family. So keep this recipe for holidays, but do not give this recipe to anybody without telling them. It's very important to have a consent to do this and to first research and to do it with your own responsibility. But uh, yeah, actually the mixture was chili, cacao and mushrooms. So chili has capsaicin and it was drink with the cacao that cacao, that chocolate, the drink liquid used to have um, stingless bee honey and achiote that make red the chocolate. And they put also a little bit of flowers, essence flowers, um, among uh, different other um, type of aromatic herbs. And the chili is very important because the chili is an anticoagulant. So our blood becomes thinner. We gotta be careful with people with low pressure with this recipe. Now the cacao is a vasodilator. It open, it open all the vessels, the, the bases. And then psilocybin is vasoconstrictive. It closes the arteries, right? So if you drink the chili and the chocolate 30 or 40 minutes before you eat the mushrooms, actually it's a wonderful type of alchemy because your body, there is more 30, 40% more blood flowing from your heart to your brain and so on, moving through all your body. The organs are receiving all of these other plants that you add. And you have sort of what we call the base of ground or what we, what we can call the carrier for the medicine. So when the mushrooms comes in, they go directly to the different parts of the body, mind, speech, soul, spirit, whatever you believe in, in a more kind and steadfast way, in a more direct way. There is no intermediate, it's a uh, um, direct experience one way or another one. Um, so this Holy Trinity is actually one of the things that um, it's, it's worth to research and to learn before drinking. Mm. Now we come to a little bit of uh, iconoclast and transgressive proposals here. Um, I'd also, um, I put them as a way to question, where are we going with all of this shamanism and, and this uh, psychotherapy assisted uh, part that we're living today? So actually, uh, Cacao Huasca, I'm coining the term, but the one who actually said about something about it was Jonathan Odd years ago. And he actually compares cacao with ayahuasca in the sense that they are both medicine carriers. Mm, he says it's analogous because cacao was never drink, chocolate was never drink a lot. They will always use fungi or other so-called empty Um And ayahuasca was like that before. They used to put a lot of admixture on it. The main difference here is that ayahuasca by itself is psychotropic. Now, cacao, it's no tropic. 
it enhances memory, cognition, retentive. It also helps to be more focused. It's a, what I call it's a mindfulness catalyzer um, and has a lot of pro other properties. But, but yeah, actually cacao wasca <laughs> was real. Maybe not with that name, but that was the way that was used before. Now, Yopolate, <laughs> could this work? Cacao itself, the bean, is one of the most complex pharmacological plants in the entire world. There's so many amount of compounds that every year there's something new found in chocolate. But sadly, because of the commercial, highly processed ways that we transform cacao beans into chocolate in the modern world, a lot to not say 90% of all of these substances are lost in the process of transformation. And that's where we get to the point to us. So then what ceremonial cacao looks like or, or um, ethnomedicinal chocolate? What are the properties? How do I find that? We're gonna talk about that later. Just wanted to put in, highlight this substances here, anandamide from Ananda, you know, Buddha's, Buddha's, Buddha's folk, Ananda, please, caffeine, and oil, but a very, very balanced amount. It has also phenylethylamine, that's a um, hormone of joy or bliss. Um, and it has a lot of good acid and good greases and amazing amount of uh, antioxidants. Uh, Theophylline is actually um, uh, used in clinical um, uses to revive people. Um, yeah, it has amazing amount of compounds and all of them work very mutualistic. It's like in permaculture, they talk about allelopathy. So I'm proposing the concept of psychotropic allelopathy. Now, the part of the symbols, the part of the ancient caretakers of these mysteries, it's still a big thing to research and to learn from. I, need to, I, I feel it needs to be, res be respected as a mystery itself. But here we see our friend the frog that has been highly used and sometimes me used lately. The corn, where we come from on the, on the way of the Maya seed seed. And then the cacao tree with the quetzal on top. Um, and then we, yeah, is there something like bufolate? <laughs> um, and this is a shamanic, uh, non-paid uh, publicity. Let's respect this little frog, you know, it's so in danger and there's so many other ways to trip and so many other ways to um, actually go deeper into um, spiritual quest. So uh, yeah, uh, hail to the frog and may all the people in the Sonoran Desert keep safe and the water keeps coming. Um, cacao ceremony, that's a big topic these days. And there's a lot of people actually promoting cacao mushroom ceremony. Uh, so just it, it's just a call to be careful about how we call things and the way we relate to them. Because, you know, even all these people I mentioned before and some other I will mention later from the actual uh, caretakers, they never call this cacao ceremony. So life, it's a ceremony. And if you drink cacao, then you enhance the ceremony that is life. But uh, yeah, uh, you know, there, there can be a lot of cultural appropriation uh, these times. So if you were not born in Guatemala, if you're not Mayan, <laughs> if you don't have a um, legacy, if you don't speak the language, it's very, very harmful to call your ceremony a cacao Mayan ceremony. Uh, and there's people doing this. So I'm, I just want to call attention to it because we can be inspired and we can be, you know, touched by these people's wisdom. But it's very different to get close to that and make our own things from it rather than just respecting the way they are. Now, I'm not saying that we cannot all make ceremonies. Yeah, life is ceremony. So why we don't drink a cow and sing kirtan or do chocolate 
uh, yoga or celebrate new year instead of getting drunk getting getting uh, infused with chocolate that there are different ways to do it um even these people that we see here don't call them ceremony that's don tonio you know and if you really want to get to know real cacao ceremony it's seven days with only cacao tobacco and balche in the jungle <laughs> The Kuna Dule, they have this beautiful beverage called Madun with plantain. Or in Oaxaca, the, the chocolate atole, it's used only for festivities, you know. Um, and there's a lot of paraphernalia, you know, just to see where they put the gourds, the type of the gourds, the molinillos, uh, the way they take the, the, um, the entire thing, you know. It's about also about cultivating our relation. So um we better better inspire from them or get closer to them rather than just trying to invent something that is not um um that is not actual actual uh, formula um the ancestral designs let's say uh, they're very mysterious and they're very untouched Mm, this is, for example, a community cacao ceremony in Mexico, the, the picture we're seeing in the middle. And this is, this is done like a chocolatada when somebody's going to get married. They just make hundreds of liters of cacao and everybody drinks chocolate. Um, but now, depending on what the festivity is for, they add or they take out ingredients. The emerging paradigms of what I call the emerging ceremonial-like uh, cacao context go from choco, kirtan, chocolate yoga, cacao static dance, cacao sound bath, cacao mindfulness, um, to I really, really like. It's one that was born in Colombia, Cacao Teadero. It's like a chocolate talking circle inspired on the Asian use of the coca leaf and the tobacco. And Chocolatada, it's actually a beautiful one in Mexico. Every little town you go in Mexico, you can find Chocolatadas in every corner, every Sunday or so, because that's the way that people relate each other. Um, by this way, we can say that chocolate is a vehicle of social reciprocity in the, in the context of these ways of using it. Um, in my humble opinion, you know, I'm speaking always from a place of self-thought research and very empirical, but in my humble opinion, chocolate can be used in the future as a potential integration support for psychedelic assisted therapy, emotional balance. Um, and my personal case has helped me a lot to grieve in integration and mourning process. It really helps into the treatment for major depressive disorders. Um, I have found a lot of people on the road that has healed themselves from major depressive disorder by drinking uh, hot chocolate in heroic doses in the morning during 21 days or so on. It helps to stimulate the creative expressions. It can be used for people that are actually musicians or uh, working with art or doing different things. It actually enhances that practice. It's, is a heart-centered spiritual practice and hazer. So in my case, I love to drink chocolate and just sit down and sing. Uh, and it's an enactogen, but a nootropic enactogen, an empathogen. So, you know, uh, MDMA is also considered an empathogen, but it has these other uh, side effects. Now, chocolate is an all-inclusive, meaning that from pregnant woman to kid, everybody can feast on this the life will gift from the monkeys and the so-called gods. It's not a panacea. Chocolate is not going to solve the problems of your life. Cacao and mushrooms <laughs> won't um, take you to samadhi instantly, but it's a medicine carrier. Some people will, will agree on this, other none, but I consider cacao an adaptogen. It's a great nootropic, uh, um, as I have said, a medicine carrier. Um, it's an all-purpose toni tonic elixir, and it really helps to enhance biophilia. Uh, so these are my most uh, iconoclast proposal. I propose cacao with the use of mushrooms or other substances. 
as a psychotropic symbiotic agent, a cardioplasticity catalyzer. There's a lot of neuroplasticity being talked in the psych community, but what about the heart? You know, what about the heart, spiritual heart? We also need some plasticity there, let go, relax, see the multi-diversity of um, ways that we can engage with this plants and medicines and um, amazing gift. Um, and two almost forgotten words, I want to bring them into the Psy community, is allelopathy and trophology. Trophology, the ancient science of the correct mixture of, from a nutritional perspective, and allelopathy, as I said before, in permaculture and other agriculture, as the mutualist uh, aspect of plants, of helping each other. So, yeah, I think there's entire research to be done on this side, and cacao is a good friend, a good boat to let ourselves be driven into these uh, paradigms. So Terence McKenna had this beautiful phrase saying that, he said that we, we were at the very beginning of grumbling and dealing with the psychedelic era. We're, we're like people talking about evolution in 1855. And uh, the more research comes out, is like Dharma or other ancient wisdom, sacred wisdom teachings. The more you learn, the more you understand that we don't know anything, that we are very ignorant and that there's an entire multiverse to be discovered. Now, I want to read you this. Um, so this is a little bit of a excerpt or, or a resume from this uh, scientific research that was done in Instituto de Fermentaciones Industriales in Spain. Um, and this was actually taken from the book Nick Chocolate. Uh, they be wolf and chassis. Uh, everybody has put a little grain here, so I'm um, being radically inclusive in this research. Uh, so he says, cacao works to potentiate the three primary psychoactive pathways. Tryptophan, tryptamin, phenylalanine, and phenylethylamine, cannabinoid, and anandamide. That way, cacao works along other pathways as well. Evidence suggests the lactone compounds are actually activated by cacao. Additionally, psychoactive plants that work on the yet to be understood principle seem to be enhanced by cacao. Again, author theorized sometime it has not yet been proven that can, cacao contains, it, it has not been proven that cacao contains MAO, MAO bitters known as tetra beta carbolins. And they might potentiate a positive flavor of the psychotropic compounds. So it's a lot of research yet to be done here, but this is a little bit of the science behind of what we have talked in the last um, slides. Now, meta shamanism, uh, we can put a double T up there in the meta. So that will be loving kindness shamanism. I love that input from Sitaram Das. Um, but actually the term was coined in a very profound way by Elias Capriles, who is an author, Zogchen instructor, and one of the most amazing living philosophers still going around this planet at this moment. He's also the author of this amazing series called the Beyond Mind Papers. Um, and for weird reasons, we were able to meet him a few times here in Colombia. And, and he actually introduces us to the concept of meta shamanism. So I cannot speak too much about it because I'm just starting to learn what is it and how do you eat it and how does it work or, or what's the difference from other type of shamanisms. But he proposed these two words. Uh, there are also neologisms. He proposed diastelo psychotropic from systole and diastole, the heart. So diastelo opens up or raises up the energy level of the range of consciousness, diastelo psychotropic, and epoch psychotropic that actually cuts through judgment um, or postpone judgment. Those are some properties that he relates to these plants. Um, but also, 
When we're talking about a metasomatic paradigm, we're talking about a non-dual, spontaneously liberating, a compassionate, merciful, a very inclusive way of understanding shamanism. Uh, it's beyond neo-shamanism or pseudo-shamanism or degenerated shamanism. There's actually nothing to fight against, but it's all about all-encompassing, all-pervading, and a, a, a way to relate with these plants beyond fear and beyond hope. Um, it requires a lot of courage to actually go into this from a direct experience. But what I can say is like people like Linda Lee have done it in their own way. <laughs> you know, Terence used to take five grams in darkness. This guy started taking 20 and 40, no, 20 and 30. Um, so I just want to leave this out there. We'll talk about metashamanism maybe later on in the years when more people start to get closer to the term. But I like that thing of putting the double T and start a movement of loving kindness shamanism. We're about to end. We're getting to the last part. I hope you are not getting bored. Um, yeah, on the, on the left side is a homemade chocolatada with kids in a school, Waldorf school here in Colombia with the Muishka community. And we were grinding our own chocolate. We're making our own ceremonial grade chocolate. That's the best way you can make ceremonial grade chocolate. Don't buy it. Get the beans, buy the beans. I'll give you later on a little bit of tips of how to do it and where to, not where to get it, because um, I want to stay free from um, commercial things. But but I will let you know some um, guidelines for getting good uh, quality chocolate cacao. And then you can grind it at home, even in a blender or in a molino. Um, you know, the ceremonial part, ceremonial grade, is also a lot of what you put into it. On the right side, there's this woman in Tepoztlan. She just walks to the market and she sells one of the most amazing chocolates I have ever tasted, stone ground in her metate. There is not even a sticker that says ceremonial grade. And is the price is just uh, ridiculous on compared to things that are sold uh, on the market as ceremonial grade. And I can say that's one of the most ceremonial grade chocolates that I have ever tasted. So really what is and what not is a ceremonial grade cacao or chocolate, it really depends on the way that you perceive it and where you get it from and how you relate with it. So don't swallow it blindly. Um, any bean can be transformed into ceremonial grade cacao. The guidelines to find that, get ethically sourced beans, maybe what is called today fair trade can work, heirloom seed, small holding harvest, family own, cope initiative. If it is direct link with indigenous community, the better, the best, low footprint. And yeah, if it has reciprocal restoration practices like planting more uh, diversity of plants around cacao, that's amazing. Um, if you don't want to make it or you don't have time, you can just go and buy a hundred percent bar of chocolate, the most organic or, or the most, uh, yeah, well, well sourced one. And you can use that as a ceremonial grade chocolate, but also you can go deeper and like wine or like other, uh, delicacies, you can go and find every time better or better quality. But let's keep it simple. The more humble the origin, the most profound it will take you, actually. So when it's metate, stone ground, it's amazing. Uh, if you know the family, if you know the local chocolate makers, that's great because you create a heart-to-heart -heart bond with these people. So you bring humanness to ceremony that is so needed these days, groundness. If it is a small batch, the flavor will be much better. Very important, lightly roasted. The lightly roasted part is very important. The way they do it in Guatemala and Mexico is they have the comal and they put the seeds and they just move it around. And then they hold it until they can hold it in their hands. 
So it's not roasted. It's just lightly roasted, but it's not raw either. I'm not um, a fanatic of raw chocolate. I have my doubts about it and I will not encourage people to eat raw chocolate, but lightly roasted is the way that the ancients used to do it. So you better try that way. Uh, no additives, no lecithin, no sugar, no bull. <laughs> um, be careful with that. The most 100% you can get the bar, the liquor, the mass, or the bar, or the linguist, lingote, the better. Uh, and there are hundreds of people doing that in the States and everywhere in a lot of places around the world. Um, this is one of my favorite ancient cacao drinking vessels. So I want to put it here because it's called the glass of the scribe rabbit. And there is actually a rabbit here writing down this cacao ceremony um it's and the art museum of princeton in, and it's it's so unique the mayans also saw uh rabbit in the moon and also and uh, tibetan lineages they also have painted rabbits in the moon so there is a relation of the rabbit the moon and the chocolate we don't still yet know uh, researching about it this is me in the modern way drinking a lot of high red doses of chocolate behind the computer trying to put together this story um, and none, nonetheless but very important some harm reduction advices be careful with people with low pressure when you're uh, introducing chocolate go one step at a time research um, take them in, with intimacy um, I'm on the side of the psychonaut uh, perspective of preferably starting alone or with somebody that will take care of you in a, in a dark uh, space, maybe with a little fire in the mountain. That could be a great way to start um, learning from it. Avoid sharing the medicines before you get to know them well. You know, um, I've been doing, I've been drinking chocolate for 10 years. And at some moment I started sharing a lot of chocolate and it was hard what I started to experience emotionally and spiritually and energetically. You really need to have a capacity of holding space to share medicine, even if it is chocolate. So be careful of sharing before you get to know well the medicines. Um, get to know your dose, start with 26 gram and then you can go scaling up. I love cacao tolerance. Cacao tolerance is one of the great ways to define um, the way of cacao devotion. So um, yeah, you can start scaling up and getting to actually high doses of cacao without getting dizzy or getting um, nausea. But if you drink for first time 50 grams of cacao, you have never drink chocolate before and then you eat the mushrooms, you might have a bad trip and you might have um, very uh, awful um, secondary effects. So just go slow at a time. Nano doses and micro doses are very good in this aspect. Keep yourself well hydrated. It's highly important. Chocolate is very greasy and puts the liver to work a lot. What I recommend is from Tibetan medicine, don't drink cold water or temperature water, drink boiled water, maybe um, mid temperature. It helps to digest and it helps the inner fire keep going. So it's very good when you drink chocolate, keep hydrated and drink uh, warm water. Hold space for yourself and hold a space for the older ones around you. Uh, and journal your insights. This is very important for this um, uh, self research, auto, auto, uh, self research, auto investigation. Now, I just want to close by telling a little story, a very short one about a myth. A myth that is around Peru, Mexico, Costa Rica, Panama, Colombia. And it said that it said that in ancient times, people like us came down from the mountain to the jungle and they started destroying the jungle because they got greedy feelings and selfish uh, motivation. They wanted to have more land to plant more of the things they were eating. And they started exchanging gold and clay for other things. So they needed to plant more for do more exchange. 
And at some moment, they started to kill their own mother, their own um, sustenance, the jungle. And the local spirits of the thunder got very, 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 very angry with the humans because they were not actually respecting their own selves by not respecting the ground, by not respecting the habitat. And then this huge storm came and destroyed all the harvest. And these people got very, very sad. But suddenly a little girl went down to that area, time passed, and she found that all the places where they used to plant and where they used to cut the jungle, there were these new trees growing on. And there are these big pots full of colors growing on the trees. And then it says that the, the cacao came as a gift to humans to learn how to relate in a more reciprocal and regenerative and balanced way with the environment. So actually this is a, a living myth because there's uh, hundreds of families right now uh, making reforestation, agroforestry, productive diversification and ecosystem ecosystemic services by planting cacao along by with sapote and with achote, even with capi, ayahuasca, and La Fundación Amazonia Viva in the Amazon has this beautiful you know, pharmacological agroforestry project. Um, also the people up in the north in Mexico, uh, the Chinanteco and other ones. So if you can support this type of project, that's a great way to be reciprocal. We need reciprocal restoration. It's very nice to drink chocolate and to actually get the medicines uh, behind it. But we also need to be aware that the jungle is being destroyed and that it's in our hands, in our gods, in our choices, daily choices, the possibility to regenerate the land. So I just wanted to just close by uh, remembering the never ending and all pervading presence of Maria Sabina, her family in La Sierra Mazateca. These people have been harmed and have passed through very hard times. Um, and, you know, she still is here in our hearts, guiding the way to connect with Nino Santos in a humble and heart open way. So I wanted to dedicate an homage to her and also to the grace of uh, Nim Korlu Baba and the mystery of the monkey god. Uh, may all beings benefit and may cacao stay close to us and close to this mystery of the mushrooms for a long, long time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was that was that was a lot. There was so much there. And one of the things that I liked, well, I, I did like the art. You know, I, I really appreciate you being so diverse and multifaceted in the approach. And so there was, you know, science that I could understand. And then there was art and culture and, you know, best, best practices. The, you know, there's a part where, you know, we're talking about the ways that, you know, non-traditional use and how that's potentially harmful. And then my question for you was going to be is like, well, what can we do as people who want to be responsible, right? Because it's very mm -hmm. easy to, and I see this a lot in the psychedelic community is like that mm -hmm. person's doing it wrong and that person's doing it wrong and that person's doing it wrong. And well, what, well, what, what do I actually do if I want to be a responsible person, you know, and I mm -hmm. want to grow and how do I look at my own practices and make sure that they are in alignment. And so I really appreciated that, you know, especially the part where, you know, we're telling people, you don't really have to make this a business right off the bat. You don't have to necessarily share this on a large scale <laughs> um, tomorrow. You know, that is, that is a lot of people's, in, in my estimation, you know, I, I talk to a lot of people who are doing you know, perhaps, you know, psychedelics for the first time. And they they come to me and they say, everybody needs this. And, you know, that, that's, that's nice because it's my, you know, their heart's in the right place and 
you know, it's a very mycelial way of thinking. It's like, oh, let's spread this mycelially. But at the same time, it's like, um, what does it take for the roots to really go deep in our own practice in our own hearts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Daniel, for bringing the topic to the surface. Uh, I, for me, it's one of the things that I, I feel more um, engaged with in the sense of something we cannot give for granted, but who we are to be the judges or to be the ones who can say who's doing it right or wrong. But at the same time, I believe it all comes from a heart-centered feeling, right? Like um, the way I see it is we will need a lot of facilitators in the future. And we will need a very good amount of highly prepared people to hold space for more. Uh, yet I sense that we need to first do a lot of inner work, personal work, family work, community work, in order to actually have our ground steady enough so we can start opening to more people. Um, I don't believe there are good or bad ways to do it. Um, I just feel that there are ways that are a little bit more uh, intimate and more reciprocal. Um, whenever art comes in, whenever friendship comes in, whenever community comes in, it's a good omen that things are going in a way that you can rely on. When it starts to go a little bit awkward, when, when, when things are taken in the way that we used to take everything in the Western context, mm -hmm. like trying to scale it up and making it faster and getting a lot of profit from it. And I don't know, fame or whatever personal gain is like the driven force. That's when things start to crumble a little bit, but we always have the possibility to renew and to refresh our vision. I'm speaking from my own a background. So uh, there was a moment where I believed I was the chocolate shaman <laughs> and where I felt that my mission, kind of the Messiah complex, I was to share chocolate with everybody and just go around and give the recipes. And there was this moment where I realized I better research a little bit more and I better go to these people who have been doing it for a long time and learn from them before I keep sharing it from a more naive perspective. It does not mean that I don't share anymore. I share chocolate. I sit down with my friends. I, flip, I sit down with my community to do it. But now, every time I sit down, I'm in both positions. I'm in the position of the one who's learning and the one who's teaching. And I think that's a great way to relate with any sort of psychotropic and mind altering and sacred medicine. Well, the phrase that just popped into my head was folk art. You know, I really folk folk, folk art. Yeah. You know, and, and I really appreciate the folk, the folksy way of doing things. You know, um, mm -hmm. there's a lot of things that are shared. There are a lot of things that are medicine, that are powerful medicine, they're powerful sacraments that are like lovingly and casually shared amongst friends and family that sort of don't require doctors or commerce, you know, to be involved. <laughs> and, yes. you know, one of the things that hopefully we're seeing is that friends and family can take care of each other. Mm -hmm. that we, we can show up for each other and share what we have and that that can ameliorate our suffering. Like the amelioration of our suffering doesn't have to come from outside our communities. And I think that's what you're speaking fully, to. Fully in tune. Yeah, in that perspective, we are all our own therapists and we are also the walking alone by ones with others. So maybe just a little piece of chocolate left in the corner of somebody's home or uh, sharing a song or just listening to another person it's actually the medicine and the ceremony that can bring us closer to one another one. It doesn't require too much mm -hmm. of the outside, actually. Well, isn't it interesting now that I think about it, you know, in some maybe like hotels or places like that, 
Um, and maybe it doesn't happen so much anymore, but I think there was a time that you would check into a hotel and there would be chocolate on your pillow. And it was the kind of the symbol of hospitality and welcoming and oh, yeah. we're happy to have you here and welcome into our home in some ways. Yeah, yeah, I forgot about that. But actually, I'm, I'm not sure about this, but I can, I can try to, I think there, there, there's more that chocolate has gone deeper in the world than Coca-Cola. So there's even places where there's no Coca-Cola and there's chocolate. And I, I need to say this because sometimes we go into very like extreme poles of view and, and seeing things. And it's sometimes the only chocolate that I have had is one of those pillow chocolates or like a airplane chocolate. And you know, just, just holding it and just put it into the mouth and, and tasting it for what it is mm -hmm. um, has been... Um, day-to-day -day mundane and sort of like simple way of connecting with cacao spirit. That's, um, it's beautiful to kind of recognize that, you know, even in that form, that perhaps highly processed commodified form, that there's still, you know, the seed of, of goodness deep within it. You know, the seed, the pure, the purity is, is in there somewhere. I, I just recently met a folk from Mexico who actually holds cacao ceremony for people who's dealing with depression, uh, family issues, um, miscarried babies, like hard stuff. And he's just going around sharing chocolate with these people along with tobacco. Um, I consider him one of the few meta shamans that I have seen with a backpack going around doing that without charging, you know. And he actually shared to me that Sometimes he get to places and there is nothing else than commercial chocolate. And he would just ground it and put a little piece of the one that he's carrying in his pocket from made at home. And just with that little bit, he will infuse the other one. And, and that's the thing that he has. So a lot of times I think we got to work with what we have, not with what we want, what we desire, what could be ideal, but whatever is reachable in our immediate environment, it's actually what we well, that is such a good metaphor for our personal work too, isn't it? That we would like, I would like to believe that I'm more evolved and more spiritual and more brilliant than maybe I actually am. You know, I would like to believe that I don't have the issues that I have, but I do. And mm -hmm. those are the issues that I have. To, that's my work to do. And then I sprinkle in just like a little bit of practice that I picked up along <laughs> the way. And, you know, things get better. Yeah. And I think Let's leave the sprinkle. Yeah. <laughs> and that's like, you know, those of us who are doing the psychedelic work are really confronted with, we are where we are. And that's what we have. That's the work we have to do. So I appreciate you bringing that with us. Um, There's a phrase I, I, I'm, I'm going to try to put it in my own words. It's, it's maybe from Lao Tzu. And it says something like, rejoice how things are. Be grateful with what you have. When, you're la when you realize that there is nothing lacking, the entire world belongs to you. Or you belong to the entire world. That's amazing. I think that's a wonderful note to end on. And... I think that we might be having like an intensive with you in a few days or a week. <laughs> I, I, Whatever it meant, it's meant to happen. And if anybody wants to write me down, you can also share my email. Thank you very much for the invitation and to all the crew and the community. And yeah, I hope this chocolate my Chilean web keeps uh, fermenting us all. Indeed. I'm going to, I'm going to hit stop and then we'll chat a little bit afterwards. Uh, thank you all for coming. Well, uh, thank you for coming to the Psilocybin Summit. There's more great content coming up. Uh, we love you very much. Uh, Esteban, thank you for your heart. Thank you, Daniel.